So we look forward to their three contributions. And we'll hear from a social movement uh, leader, um, uh, Lida Ferreira, who is, the, who is working with the Transnational Institute, who's done a lot of fantastic work with social movements. She, uh, she's from Colombia, and she's going to talk a little bit about some of the work uh, that, uh, so responding to some of the contributions that the Union Sisters and Brothers have made. And then we can um, uh, take it from there. So, Clara, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. Um, I'm from the PCS union in the UK, uh, a union representing 200,000 public sector workers. Uh, I'm leading on green issues and campaigns, and I'm also the president of our culture sector, standing up for museum workers in institutions like the British Museum and the National Gallery. And I'd like to take this opportunity to thank Jeremy for his support before he became the leader of the Labour Party, by the way, for his support in our amazing campaign against the privatisation at the National Gallery. A National Gallery sponsored by Shell. I'd like to thank Naomi for her support for civil disobedience creative actions at uh, the Tate against the sponsorship of BP. We want big oil out of culture. We want big oil out of our museums and galleries. And I will invite you to join us on Wednesday lunchtime, 12 o'clock, at the Louvre Museum here in Paris for a creative protest against the total sponsorship. My union, PCS, has been at the forefront of trade union campaigning against climate change in the UK. We've adopted policies against the expansion of airports, for a ban of fracking and supporting the local campaign uh, across the country and against fracking. We're supporting divestment and we're supporting a just transition. But our biggest campaign as mentioned by Jeremy, has been the one million climate job, and I'm really proud, proud my union was one of the four funding uh, the campaign. It's very important that trade unions become more involved to build the climate movement. We need to stop opposing jobs and climate. If we want a just transition, we will need jobs, many, many jobs. Climate is a trade union issue. We will need jobs to build wind turbines, solar panels, install them to ensure we go 100% renewable. We will need jobs in construction to insulate homes and build sustainable housing, to tackle housing shortage and fight fuel poverty. We will need jobs in public transport to shift people from cars into buses and trains. We will need jobs in industry, in education, waste, agriculture, water management. One million climate jobs in the UK over 20 years will cut CO2 and greenhouse gas emissions by over 80%. A climate job is a job that directly reduces CO2 emissions. A climate job is a public sector job as the just transition cannot be left to the market. We need to bring back the energy sector into public ownerships. We need to bring back housing into public ownership. We need to be back transport into public ownership. And many people in the public in the UK actually support that. Only governments have got the capacity to invest such an amount of money quick enough and plan a large scale at large scale level. It does not mean we give up on democracy, grassroots movement, or local project, but we need government to act. Naomi already explained how we can pay for this already, but we keep being told there is no money. We've got a debt. We need austerity. Absolute rubbish. <laughs> In 2008, the UK found 800 billion pounds to save the banks, and in the UK, tax avoidance and evasion represent over 100 billion pounds every year. Let's be clear, if the planet was a bank, they would have already saved it. <laughs> we are now going global with climate jobs, 
uh, with campaign starting or underway or quite advanced in Canada, Norway, South Africa, New York State, Portugal, Mauritius, the Philippines, the Basque country, Le Pays Basque. We need one for France, and I count on you to help us develop that campaign. So my question is the following for Jeremy and Naomi. In a world where we are constantly being told that the market is the only viable system, that only capitalism works, how can we convince the power of the world to make climate jobs happen, to convince people we can reclaim the power from the capitalists and have the mass investment we need from government to create millions of climate jobs and save the planet? Thank you. Next, we're going to hear from the struggles in the Philippines with Joshua Mata from the Labour Central. Centro. Good evening, everyone. Um, boy, I'm so, so starstruck right now. <laughs> I've been speaking in a panel with Jeremy and Naomi. Wow. I was planning to relate about uh, uh, the story about our struggles in the Philippines. But because of the speeches that I've heard, man, it's just... It just, it just triggered something else. I'd, I'd, I'd really like to talk about what are the challenges for us in the labor movement, because come on, this is the labor movement. This is one of the biggest, the largest, the most democratic movement in the world that we can find at this point in time. Then why is it that we are not doing enough for climate change? Why is it that we're not doing enough for, for climate justice? I think, I think the, the speeches that we heard today has, should, should embolden us you know, to think big. After all, we have done a lot of things to transform the world since capitalism started. I mean, this is the movement that gave us, what, the, the weekend, it, uh, the, it gave us, uh, you know, minimum wage, it gave, uh, no, not the minimum wage, it gave us the eight hours work, it gave us, uh, it gave us uh, uh, the, you know, the food, the, the right to organize, you know, it's, it's a movement that has given us all the rights that we have all been enjoying at this point in time. And I bet you there's no right or privilege that the working class is enjoying today, no matter how little it is, that did not come from the struggle of the labor movement. So we have gone so far. Oh, come on. It's a if you don't believe that. Clap harder. <laughs> no, but seriously, 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 this is a movement that has changed the world. Unfortunately, we haven't changed, we haven't altered the very structures that has kept a huge number of workers still poor and powerless. That is the problem. And I think that is where the challenge lies. Um, the question for us, I think, is how do we make sure, how do we regain, as a movement, how do we regain our, the tradition, uh, our, our socialist tradition of emancipating the working class? How do we regain, for example, the whole vision that we had when we started this movement years, hundreds of years ago, that we're going to transform the world for everyone and that you know, we're, we're imagining a, democratic, a more radical democratic society than what the bourgeois and the capitalists have been giving us? That was the vision of the labor movement. Where is it now? We need to regain that, comrades. We We need to regain that, and I think to do that, we need to start building up power from below, not just by collective bargaining for the, you know, the bread and butter issues of the working class, but we need to make sure that the, our workers, our members, really believe, really understand that whenever we fight for, just, uh, for, for wages, whenever we fight for our right to organize, whenever we fight for whatever it is that we usually fight for, that is just a stepping stone in order to build a better society for everyone, a society that we truly deserve. Um, let me just point, let me just end by saying that, you know, we have been fighting privatization in the Philippines for a very long time. You know, um, the energy sector was privatized and contrary to all its promises, it was actually absolute disaster. But despite a disaster, despite the fact that we now, we now suffer from one of the world's highest electricity rates. Uh, 
government is still hell bent on privatizing everyone else, all the sectors in the private, public, in, in the power sector, including, for example, the electric cooperatives. And there's a there's a small group of workers down in the Philippines, 77 of them, and for the past two years they have been struggling against privatization, and they did not accept the corporatization, the sellout of their cooperative, so they went on strike. But when they went on strike, it was very clear to them that they were not just fighting to regain their jobs. They were actually fighting to stop the, the, the energy barons in the Philippines to control the power industry. But what's, more, but what's interesting now is that we have new concepts that can allow us to move beyond the bread and butter issues. For example, in their case, they realized that they should not just fight for the, the, to reclaim their jobs, that they should also work towards developing new technologies like you know, solar energy power, solarizing the, the houses of the, the, the workers in, in their own community that are now being deprived by corporations simply because they cannot pay their bills. They're the ones connecting the, the people who have been disconnected by the corporation. And obviously they're doing it illegally. You know, but they're, 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 every time the corporation disconnects them, the, the, the union, the trade unionists who have been on strike for the past two years now will reconnect them. But the point for them is that, that the point is that they are teaching the, the people in the community that they have to learn to defend their own services, their own power, their own right. And so every time the corporation starts to cut again their, their, their connection to electricity, then it's the community now that stands up. That is the kind of power that we need to build with the community. That is the kind of power we, we need, but we need to ratchet it up. We need to ratchet it up. And I think we need, to be very bold, we need to be much more bolder now. So the question is, if we don't get the just transition uh, in the agreement, if the agreement is so bad, as Naomi Klein has, put it, has put it, uh, explained it uh, so eloquently, why don't we just reject it? Why don't we just say that a bad deal, no, a no deal is better than a bad deal? Thank you very much, comrades. Next, we're going to hear from the president of the New York State Nurses Association, Judy Gonzalez, who's going to talk about some of the struggles in the New York area, New York State, and around the United States. Good evening, sisters and brothers. It is very humbling to be up here centimeters away from these people. Anyway, as millions of people around the planet demand that our world leaders craft an agreement that will address their life and death concerns, the discussions in Le Bourget continue to disappoint us. As these powerful few people in COP21 talks will say this is a historic agreement, we, the people, recognize that we're still held hostage by fossil fuel corporations, billionaires, government heads, and those who remain in denial about what has to be done to salvage our Mother Earth and respect its inhabitants. So what are just transitions? Just transitions is an urgent call for an immediate and significant transformation process that moves us away from dependency on carbon emitting poisons in a manner that embraces energy democracy. So when communities have control over the production and distribution of clean energy, that's environmental justice. In the context of this transformation, when the disproportionate harm perpetrated upon those most vulnerable but least responsible for the climate chaos, when that's mitigated and rectified in real ways, when workers whose livelihood is dependent upon the fossil fuel industry are transitioned to the multitude of jobs that can be created when we have sustainable energy practices, when families who acquiesce to leasing lands to destructive energy agencies or who have to utilize toxic energy byproducts in order to survive, when they're instead supported in new and creative ways, that's social justice. So here's no surprise, COP21 has not responded to the need for environmental and social justice in any meaningful way, and it hasn't even crafted a realistic and binding agreement that'll reduce, um, that'll reach us to the two degree mark. But these talks are, are only a part of a bigger picture. Our history, the people's history, is being formulated as we assemble here in this hall and the People's Climate Summit here in Paris and in the streets where demonstrations can and must take place in the communities and workplace fighting back and in winning small and meaningful victories to save our planet. 
Success is achieved when the fight for environmental justice is linked to the fight for economic and social justice, as we've heard, when austerity programs that harm those already suffering are pushed back, fought against, and ultimately defeated. These two issues are inextricably linked. There is an umbilical cord pulsating with life that binds them together. In the United States, it was people's power that stopped the XL pipeline. In New York, In New York, it was relentless organizing, educating, and agitating that forced the governor to not only call for a moratorium on fracking, but to ban it forever. In our nurses' union of 38,000 members, when people said, well, what, what's this climate stuff? We, why are we doing this? Well, we had to study and we had to learn about um, this dangerous practice of hydraulic fracturing. We didn't know what it was either. And we had heard that ExxonMobil and Halliburton and BP said this is a clean and safe energy alternative. Well, what did we find out? We found out it was worse than anyone imagined. And as healthcare professionals, we see the ill effects of climate change every day for every patient we care for who has asthma, or when we do disaster relief, as many of us did after Hurricane Katrina, after the typhoon Yolanda, and thousands of us after Hurricane Sandy hit our own city where Wall Street was up and running in two days and there's still people in Staten Island who have no home. So we developed a curriculum around climate change that we continue to educate our members and I, we have some copies over here um, along with some t-shirts over there uh, if anyone's interested in building a curriculum around it. So what did we learn about fracking? Because we had to understand it, right? We found that it polluted the air, contaminated the water, that introduced carcinogenic and endocrine altering chemicals in our land, that the methane leads from fracking not only make drinking water flammable in some areas, but its release into the environment contributes to the warming of the planet in far greater quantities than anyone thought. So since corporations and government choose to ignore scientific data as it's convenient for them, and they manage to skirt regulatory mechanisms where they exist, we knew we had to not only educate our nurses, but to move them into action, working alongside patients and communities and environmental organizations, notably Food and Water Watch in New York, and that was the coalition whose strategic and tireless efforts were ultimately successful in banning fracking. But what did we find out? There's always a way around these things. We discovered that while fracking was banned, frack byproducts, which were flammable and dangerous, are being transported through our state. These so-called bomb trains, such as the one that exploded in Quebec in 2013, murdering 47 people, are making their way through communities in our state, jeopardizing the lives of thousands of residents, many in poor communities, who live near the train tracks. So we organized our members and worked with our neighbors to demand an end to these trains, which is an ongoing process, but we are not giving up, because fighting for justice is never-ending process, and we're so thankful to, to Sean and Trade Unions for Energy Democracy for bringing us along and educating us around this fight for climate justice. So what's the message? High-level negotiations of the powerful are not going to bring us energy democracy and environmental and social justice. Debunking the myth that unions and workers are some sort of an entity separate and apart from communities is a critical element in uniting our forces. Recognizing that poorer communities, particularly communities of color, whether they're in Buffalo, the Bronx, or Bangladesh, they're the hardest hit, always by hazardous and unsafe practices. Learning, teaching, and sharing what we know in a collective manner, organizing to bring folks together, not to beg, but to demand a safe and satisfying future. Helping people to make the connection that exploitation on the job is perpetrated by the same entities as those who poison our environment, demand cuts in services, force us to live in substandard housing, eat unwholesome food, all of which contribute to an unhealthy population. As nurses, we're embedded with the public's trust. We in New York, along with our sisters and brothers in National Nurses United, Global Nurses United, and various other healthcare unions, we're committed to deserve that trust and utilize our knowledge and our influence and our pledge to advocate for society's most vulnerable, to contribute to this all-important struggle for a clean and safe planet, one that allows all people to live in dignity. And uh, I have a question here. I'm supposed to... John said we had to ask questions. <laughs> so our question 
for our panelists is, um, what do you believe that those of us in trade unions should focus on in the next year that you believe might move this struggle forward in really qualitative ways? That's our question to you. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. It's been phenomenal um, for me personally to be based in New York, to be working with the nurses there. They've done such a fantastic job with our members, going to every hospital before the People's Climate March, talking up the health implications of climate change and really engaging their members. I think they're a model union in that respect. Um, so our last contributor from the panel is Lita Ferreira, who's uh, with Transnational Institute. Uh, I made a contribution at our energy democracy session at the People's Summit a couple of days ago, and based on that, we thought she would make a useful, a very useful contribution to, to this conversation today. So, Lita, if you don't mind, thank you. Yeah, first of all, thanks for the invitation. Um, it's, it's an honor to be here with you, but also with the people here, the trade unions. As, as Shannon was saying, um, I'm from a, an organization in, in Amsterdam, the Transnational Institute, but we work together in support um, to, with social movements. So for us to have this opportunity to exchange with you some of our concerns is, is an honor. Um, we were hearing about the climate crisis and, and how people are experiencing it. And we, were say, we heard here that um, the crisis need to be solved from its real, its root cause. So we, I wanted to bring a contribution on, on that perspective, which are the root causes of the crisis. Um, and we think the crisis is systemic. In that way, uh, we need to think on a change of system. But the challenge here is to define what do we understand by a system change. Um, and we are looking at different impacts and different conflicts generated by the, by the crisis itself, by the system itself. We think one of the main parts of this crisis is related to the extraction. So yes, fossil, fossil fuels, but also the extraction of water and the large-scale production, production of uh, agro-industrial products. People are being affected everywhere by that, and we see uh, different communities being displaced, the territory is being polluted and contaminated. And mainly, that is to deepen and reinforce the uh, mining industry, the extraction industry, and in order to solve the energy needs from the north. So we think we need to construct, to build a different way of understanding the, the world where we can see to satisfy the needs, we don't need to keep on extracting. We don't need to keep on using fossil fuels. We don't need to keep on uh, uh, polluting the territory or we don't need um, to continue displacing and uh, affecting the communities. So that is something that we have been struggling until now and discussing with communities. People are defending the territories and saying, we need to stop the uh, expansion of the extraction border. That is an, an imperative for the communities in the south, but also in the north. So we said, OK, this is very important uh, if we think on the real roots of the current crisis. And then, OK, we are facing that, and we are bringing that here to the COP. But the COP is not being able to address any solution into this. The COP is finding or offering solutions, false solutions as we call them, that only deepen this kind of extraction. And at the same time, this kind of extraction is violating the labor rights. So as we see, it's, it's a whole system that affects the society and keeps on deepening and deepening um, the climate crisis that we are facing. And we say, we can see at the same time that there are agreements that protect the drivers of this crisis. We identify the corporations as the drivers of this crisis. So we can say that the, the COP right now is captured by corporations. They are uh, 
proposing their solutions. They are uh, creating barriers for the communities, for the people, for the movements to participate at the current discussion, at the current negotiations. And at the same time, the corporations are creating other spaces to protect their own rights. And that's what is related to the trade deals that you were mentioning. So we have now two different uh, spheres of agreements. We have the, co the current cap, which is happening, that we are facing and saying it's not addressing any solution to the crisis. In the opposite, it is deepening and deepening the problems, the conflicts that we are facing. On the other hand, we can see the corporations are finding more and more areas, more spheres to increase their rights. And those are the free trade agreements, the investment agreements. And peoples and movements are facing these threats around the world. So we say, okay, we are in different fronts of the struggles. How can we link those dots? How can we link those fronts of the struggles and come together? We think this is not only about fighting um, against one specific corporation. It is not only uh, fighting to defend specific rights. This is a struggle for the life. We are talking about life. And we, we know that there are already alternatives being imagined. You were chasing us and, and challenging us to imagine. I think there are already alternatives being imagined at different levels. Energy democracy is one of those alternatives. Food sovereignty is one of those alternatives. The defense of the territories and the communities themselves is one of those alternatives. So now the question is, how can we bring all the, these proposals together? How can we bring all the struggles together in one united front to defend life? 